Good morning. This is Sam Hinton with Mount Underwood Baptist Church and Samuel Sega Ministries. Thank you for coming online with us to worship the Lord and to uh, receive a message from Him. I pray it's helpful to you this week. And for uh, each one of our friends that are out there that were not able to be here today, God bless you and we're praying for you. And I look forward to seeing you next time. And for those of you that are out of state, uh, Granny and Grandpa and Valerie, Uncle Keith, and Susie, uh, uh, Uncle Steve, uh, Taylor, uh, Dawson, God bless y'all. Nelson, Brittany, Nathaniel, Christian, God bless y'all. We're praying for y'all. And uh, all our friends at the nursing homes. We love you and we miss you. And God is there with you. Do not forget that. Amen. But share him with everyone that you come across. Because each person needs Jesus. And with that, does anybody have any special prayer requests? And we'll open up with a word of prayer. And then jump into our song service. I I got a hold of this Did you get a hold of her? Praise the Lord. Yeah. I know, I know. Well, uh -huh. well, I'm glad you got a hold of her. Yeah. What a blessing. Well, that's good. That's good. Amen. Well, we give the Lord the praise and glory. We got our salvation signs up out front, and uh, we're praying that the Lord uses those. So when you uh, think about it, ask God to convict the hearts of those that pass by, and that uh, not only would souls be saved, but fellow Christians would be challenged to reach out and do more for the Lord and to lift their voices up for the Lord. Uh, we're just a little church here. But we want to be known as the big the little church with a big mouth for Jesus. We want to be about our Father's business. And even if we're not present here in the building throughout the week, we want God's word to be preached, even uh, as people pass by. So lift that up with Lord in prayer, and I know that the Holy Spirit's going to use it for His glory and His honor. And, uh, oh yes, I do have a special prayer request for everyone out there. If you would, please pray for me. Um, but I give God the glory for healing my lungs. I can speak so much better now than breathe. Uh, but I'm having some problems with my bladder. So if you would pray for that. I'm going to try to set up a doctor's appointment uh, this week or whenever they can get me in. Um, I don't know if it's just so I can go witness to the doctor or what's going on, but uh, I'll have to check me out. So please pray for that. Uh, my doctor does not know the Lord, so I will be witnessing to him. So pray that when I see him, God will give me favor with him. I've talked to him about the Lord in the past, and uh, uh, he's been receptive to the message, uh, but he still does not know the Lord. So we're praying for his salvation and many more people also. Uh, does anybody else have any special prayer requests? Sister Mary, Brother Don, Mom, Erica, Mary, and uh, all right. Well, let's go through the Lord in prayer and then we'll sing some songs. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the good week. We thank you for the uh, opportunity to put out your gospel message uh, and uh, the opportunity to uh, see souls saved and the opportunity to serve you each and every day. We pray as we move forward throughout this week, this new week that you would help us to lift up our voice for you and to speak out for your name's sake to be bold witnesses and to uh, 
Mm -hmm. Be able to harvest souls, Lord. That these last days we know your return is pretty close, your, your resurrection, rapture is at the door, and we are looking forward to that, Lord. We're looking forward to meeting you in the sky and being with you forevermore. That we want to take as many people with us as we can, so please help us. I, I thank you for our friends at the nursing homes. Lord, I thank you that Miss Mary got a hold of her aunt, and we pray that you would continue to bless there and just help our friends there at the nursing homes to feel your comfort and your love and feel your presence in their life, knowing that you will never leave them nor forsake, forsake them. Well, I pray that they could find good friends while they're there and that you would use them to be able to be a good witness to those that take care of them. And uh, Lord, we pray for those that take care of them, that they would do a job wholeheartedly as unto you, and that you would, uh, would give them a soft, compassionate heart as they care and, and minister to those that have needs. Lord, we pray for your blessings on this service. We ask that you would touch our hearts, that you would draw us closer to you, and that you would challenge us to be better people for you each and every day, shining brighter and brighter, as you've said we are to do. We thank you so much for all these things. Bring peace to Jerusalem, bless the Jews, Lord. Help the people working with the Jews. Give them wisdom and discernment as they try, try to present your gospel and try to allow them to see that you are their Messiah. Take the scales off their eyes, even as you did with Paul, and open their eyes and show them that you are the Redeemer, the Messiah that they have been looking for. We thank you for all these things, Jesus, in your precious holy name. Amen. All right. We're going to be on page two to start with.
the Lord. But thank God that he does not. So let's say that we have to have a perfect voice or a perfect uh, uh, way of singing. But he said to lift our voice and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. He loves it all. All right. Hey, how about 447? Which verse is this? Uh, one and four. We sang this last week, but it's such a good song. We'll sing it again. Amen. When we walk with
saying Jesus loves me at the BIBLA, but then I think we have a special today. Looking forward to that. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the This is a story of long ago about a man who owned a little store. He said, I was proud to have my name up over the door. This was some 2,000 years ago, as I recall. The store was located in Jerusalem, across the street from Pilate's Hall. He said, I had had everything anyone would ever need, and folks would come from miles around, regardless of their creed. The only thing I had I never thought I would sell was in a corner on a shelf. Three old rusty spike nails. Then one day a big Roman soldier came through the door. As he walked it seemed he shook the floor. Can I help you sir? I said in a voice I guess seemed frail. He just looked at me with a sneering grin and said yes I want to buy some big big nails. Three old rusty spikes is all I have, sir. He said, for me, that'll do. For the job I have, three's enough. How much do I owe you? He placed the money in my hand. I was glad to make the sale. And then I asked him, sir, what can you do with just three old rusty spike nails? He said, have you ever heard of a man named Jesus the Nazarene? I said, the man that goes about doing good? Oh, yes, that's the man, he said. Well, today I intend to show the world who's boss. For with these three old rusty nails, I'm going to nail Jesus to the cross. I stood there almost numb, and you'll never know how I felt. I said, please, sir, don't do that, as on my knees I knelt. He just turned away. I got up and followed him. I said, sir, please, I'll buy them back. He just looked at me and grinned. And across the distance, I could see the howling mob through the tears that filled my eyes. Away with him, crucify him, I could hear their angry cries. And over all the groans and the pain of agony, 
I could hear the sound of the hammer as the big Roman soldier nailed Jesus to the cross. With three rusty nails, they nailed Jesus to the cross. The sun turned to darkness on that day. T'was the day that Jesus died, and the blood flowed from his side. The blood that washed my sins away. All right. It's centered up here. Well, I don't know about y'all, but that, that breaks my heart to hear that story because that's what actually happened. And, uh, you know, we don't know if he, that that soldier went to the, to the uh, marketplace to buy the nails or what, but they had the nails and they nailed it to the cross. And Jesus did that for us and for everyone whosoever will. But that's what we're going to preach a little bit about today. Before we uh, jump into the message, let's have a word of prayer. We'll open up and uh, we'll get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you so much for this time. We pray that you bless this message. pray that you drive back any demonic forces from trying to hinder your work and trying to get to hinder us from receiving what you want for us. Pray that you touch each and every heart that hears the message. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, before we get started in the message, I'd like to go over the Ten Commandments again. It's a, a wonderful reminder. And we find these in Exodus 20. And it starts out, if you have yours there in your pew, you can read with us. But I'll read along. But God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's what Jesus has done for every person that's been redeemed. But then he goes on and says, Number one, thou shalt not have no other gods before me. God does not want us to have things in front of him. He wants him to be first. Number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is, or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Number three, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children up to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Been showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Number four, thou shalt not take, this is a big one guys, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. We hear that all the time in movies and hear people saying, uh, taking God's name in vain, using his name without reverence. God's not going to hold them guiltless. We need to remember that. Number five, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy sons, nor thy daughter, nor thy bad servants, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord hath made 
heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, then rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, but hallowed it. Number six, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Number seven, thou shalt not kill. Number eight, thou shalt not commit adultery. Number nine, thou shalt not steal. Then number ten, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not come at thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not come at thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is in thy neighbor's, that is thy neighbor's, but the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. And this is found in Exodus 20. But uh, those gods of silver and gods of gold or with a little G, by the way, and uh, there's only one God, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, and they're three in one, and they are our creator, and we will stand before them one day and give an account for the deeds done in this body, whether good or evil. And... Uh, those that know the Lord as their Savior and have received His salvation will live with Him forever and ever. Those that have not received Him as their Savior will go into eternal punishment that was never designed for mankind, but was designed for the devil and his angels. And so uh, those that refuse to repent and turn from their sins and turn to Christ, uh, unfortunately go to that place that the devil that the Lord prepared for the devil and his angels alright well uh, we are going to be uh, in Luke 14 today Luke 14 and then in 2 Samuel those will be our two main passages um, and I have two verses that I'm going to read starting out with but if you want to turn to Luke 14 in 2 Samuel 23. All right. Title this message, Do Everything You Can to Make Sure God's House is Full. Do Everything You Can to Make Sure God's House is Full. Now in the Old Testament and the New Testament we find that salvation is open to whosoever will. In the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 32, the Bible says that it shall come to pass that whosoever, listen, whosoever, to call in the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. That's in Joel 2.32. In Acts 2.21, the Bible tells us that it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the Call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone knows John 3.16, for the most part I should say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Salvation is open to everyone. God loves each and every one of his children. And we're all ultimately his children. Though, though we died, 
in the Garden of Eden spiritually, we're still his creatures, his creation. We're all one big family. And he died for all of us to pay with his blood for our sins so that we could have redemption, be set free of our bondage but our sins, and have a restored life, a new life, an abundant life, to be able to live for him, but ultimately live with him in eternity. Now, in Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, verse 15, is so where we'll be starting out. The Bible, uh, God here gives some instructions to the disciples and to uh, those that were around him and gave them a parable. And in that parable, we can find how we as Christians should be serving the Lord also. In Luke 14, verse 15, the Bible says, that when one of them, and when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. Then sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one consent began to make excuses. The first one said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must need go see it, go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. But another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, but I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. But another said, I have married a wife, but therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed this Lord these things. Then the master of the house was being, then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, but bring in hither the poor and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. Then the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Then the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of the, those men which were bidden shall taste at my supper. Now we find multiple things in here in this passage that can be applied to us as Christians. Firstly, he said, let me send his servants at the supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. Now, God has everything prepared in heaven for whosoever will. As a matter of fact, he said that he was going to prepare a place for him. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I would go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. But if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And, uh, and then, then he says, that where I am, there he may be also. And so God has a place prepared, just like this, this uh, certain man prepared a great supper, was preparing it for his friends, for those that he cared about, those that he loved, that he invited them to this supper. But God invites whosoever will to come to, to know him to come to his house to be with him. But like, like uh, this man's friends, this man's loved ones, the people he cared about, did send out his servants to go tell them, to warn them, 
to bring them, to welcome them. But like so many in this world do, they made excuses. And sadly, we find denial. Not only in this world are lost people making excuses to come to the Lord, but Christians are making excuses not to serve the Lord. They're making excuses, all kinds of excuses, to do anything and everything but what they're supposed to be doing for the Lord. But this, this master sent out his servants again after his friends and loved ones and those that he cared about had rejected his invitation, but said, go out into the uh, uh, streets, go out and, and bring in the lame and the halt, and the poor and the maimed, and the blind, those would be people, especially in those days, that were looked over, that were thought of uh, not being worthy to be bidden to a great feast or a great supper such as was being presented. But yet, this master said, go and get them. I'll welcome them. I'll love them. I'll have them in for this dinner since these other people rejected my invitation. But God wants us to know that no matter what condition we are in, no matter who we are, no matter what's going on in our life, that He loves us and that we are welcome in His home and that each person out there that we come across is welcome and God wants them to be part of His family also. He wants them to, be, to spend eternity with Him. And yet, even though these servants went out and, and called these different people, uh, they said there's still more room. But there's always going to be more room in God's house. But there's plenty of room for whosoever will. There will not be anyone that stands before God in, in eternity that gives an account for this life that's going to be able to say, well, there wasn't enough room for me. Well, I didn't, I wasn't welcome. All we should all, as Christians, should welcome in everyone. We should let them know that they're loved. We should let them know that, that God can set them free of their sins, of their bondage, of, of their, their uh, things that are, are holding them down and they're strapped to. People have all kinds of addictions in this life, all kinds of torments that they're suffering with, all kinds of sorrows, and, and God can set them free of those things. God can give them victory over the sin that's in their life. But Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And uh, the devil would deceive people and make them feel like uh, they can have fun and have a, a abundant life sitting, but the wages of sin is death. And that, that is the paycheck for sin. But the Bible says there's joy in sin for a season, but a season runs out very fast. As you've seen, summer was here, now it's gone, winter's here, but it's coming in quick. Bad seasons come and go. Bad, you may have a little fun for a while in your sin, but it's not going to last very long. But you can have an abundant joy in the Lord when you come to know Him as your Savior. But when you start serving Him or when you lean on Him and you learn to trust in Him, and you see him working in your life. You see him changing other people's lives. You get the experience of winning people to, to Jesus. Then knowing, having that joy in your soul, knowing that that person will not have a fear and a danger of hell anymore, but will have a home in heaven. God puts that in each Christian's heart that gives him the ability to be able to win souls 
He's called us to be ambassadors for him. But he says we've been given the gift of reconciliation. And so for all those that are tied down to sin, if you have sin in your life that you want to be set free from, call out to the Lord. If you've never had salvation, you can only be saved once. But once you're saved, you're always saved. You're not going to lose that salvation. I think there's a lot of people that are going to find themselves on the resurrection rapture day that are going to be left behind that have made false professions or uh, uh, just been religious and gone to church and done different things, but there's never been any proof of salvation in their life. When a person comes to know the Lord as their Savior, there will be a change. Amen. There will be a change. But the Bible says a righteous man falls seven times, then gets up again, dusts himself off, then keeps on marching forward, marching towards heaven. But a, 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 the Bible says that some are like the swine that returns to the sloth or the dog to returns to the vomit. But so many people that say they're a Christian, over and over and over, just return right back to their old ways, return back to their old sins, return back to the things that they've all done, always done, but there's just never no ch a change in their life. But sadly, many, many people are going to be left behind by the resurrection rapture, or they're going to die and expect that they were going to go to heaven, having never received Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because when Jesus comes in, he makes that change. When something as big as the God of this universe comes in and dwells within your body, yes. cuts your soul loose from this flesh, seals your soul, keeps you to the day of redemption, there is a change. But it's something that you will know and you will remember forever. If you're somebody out there that says, I don't know when I got saved. I've just always been saved. Well, you got a problem. Amen. Because you have to have conviction. You have to realize that you're in danger of hell. That you're not going to go to heaven. The Holy Spirit works in your heart. Convicts you of your sins. And he'll bring you to a place to where you will either accept or reject him. Yes. And when you accept him, he comes in and he seals you. But it's the experience that you will never forget. You may not never know the exact date. You may not know uh, the exact time on the clock. But you will know the experience. Amen. You will know the place. I can take you to the church that I was saved in. I can walk you from just about to the very spot I was sitting where I got saved. And I felt like the whole world had been lifted off of me. I felt like I was floating. I, when I went outside, the air was fresher. The sky was bluer. The grass was greener. But I could still smell the smell, the cleanness of the air. And I just totally remember I was a brand new person. An absolutely brand new person. Amen. But even at that young age of salvation, I had to start making choices to serve the Lord. I had my best friend with me, and uh, I had to make the choice as to whether uh, I was down in Florida. I had to make the choice as to whether I was going to come back home and uh, be here in North Carolina or stay down there in Florida where I've been invited to stay with my aunt and uncle to uh, uh, kind of get a foundation under my feet and get away from the uh, people I was around and get away from the things that were, were holding me back and uh, that I had been doing. And I, I made that choice. I made that choice to stay down there. It wasn't an easy choice, but there's something I thought about and I knew I needed to do. And God used that and 
use that as a time for me to grow in the Lord and to read His Word and to get, get to know Him better. And uh, then shortly thereafter is when I found out that I had a tumor on my spinal cord. And uh, from there, things progressed to where um, I'm now quadriplegic. But my point is, when you're saved, you'll know it Amen. and it'll change. Uh, and it, it's a forever change. I'm not perfect. I'm not, I'm not obtained, just like Paul said, he had not obtained. But he forgot the things of the past and pressed towards the, 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 the press towards an eternity with a mark for the prize of a high calling. Yes. Now, uh, we see in this scripture, this passage here, that the three times the offer for salvation is sent out. Three times in verse 17, verse 21, the verse 23. There's one there for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost. In 17, he says, But he sent his servant at the supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. God wants us to know all things are ready. But truly it is more ready than ever before. We find in verse 21, uh, he said, So the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, that bring in hither the poor, the the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And then finally in verse 23, we see that the Lord also said, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out to the highway and hedges, they compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. So three times right here in this little passage, the Lord wants us to know that he wants his house filled. He wants people to come to know him as their Savior. Now, many times we in our lives, well, I'm not going to say everybody, Maybe it's just me. But how many of you have said, if only I can live my life over again? If only I can do things differently again? I have. I, I've said that. I've said that about many things in my life. But uh, sadly, we cannot do that. None of us can go back. No other, none of us can start over. Uh, I know in uh, some games when we were kids, we'd play over. We would uh, be playing uh, Cowboys and Indians or something. And we'd say we shot one or the other. We'd be like, no, we'll start over. We'll start over. Well, we can't do that. We can't start over now. We, we have to keep going with what we have, and we have to move forward. And we have to press towards the mark of the high calling. Press, press towards the Lord. Uh, draw nigh to Him. Uh, it's this life and one more. You have this life and then you have eternity. Amen. And that's it. There's no, no, no do-overs. And so what you're going to do for the Lord now is going to matter for eternity. Now, uh, there are people out there that say they're Christians, but they're Christians uh, uh, one day a week, or they're Christians uh, part of the time and the rest of the time. They live for themselves. They live for this world. They live for the pleasures of this world. And that's not the way we as Christians should be. We should be Christians seven days a week. But Christian is a person that is Christ like. They were first called Christians at Antioch. And the reason they were called Christians is because it was that the people were acting like Christ. They were little Christ. They were going around doing things like Jesus, being like Jesus, wanting to follow Jesus. Jesus was their master, 
they're, they're, they're leader. He was, uh, they were his disciples. They followed him. They did as him. So the people in Antioch that were lost, they started calling them Christians. Before that, it was just called the way. It was called, those people are of the way. And now we're called Christians. But it was a mockery, actually. It was not a compliment. But I take it as a compliment to be called a Christian. But I pray that you do, too. I pray that you can wear proudly on your shoulders the name of Christ. And uh, that's what we should do. Now, there are going to be people in heaven that stand out more so, more so than others. The Bible says the first will be last and the last will be first. But if you would, I'd like to read to you some of the men that will stand out in heaven. We find them in 2 Samuel 23. 2 Samuel 23. Now, for those of you online who are listening, and if any of you kids are listening, uh, this is an exciting passage of Scripture. We see a lot of uh, exciting things that take place in this passage. So I pray that you listen and listen intently. Uh, I have a few points to make after we read this because I think it will help you and encourage you. But in 2 Samuel 23, verse, starting in verse 8, the Bible says, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tishmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains, the same was Adonai, and Adonai the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. So this man slew 800 people with his spear at one time. I don't know how that happened. I can't wait to see it replayed in heaven. It's going to be amazing. Verse 9. But after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Oahite, one of the three mighty men with David. When they defiled the Philistines that were gathered together to battle, then the men of Israel were gone away. Listen to what he did. He arose and smote the Philistines. But till his hand was weary, then his hand played unto the sword, and the Lord brought a great victory that day. Now listen, the Lord brought that victory. Amen. But that man was willing to stand and fight. He stood and fought alone, till his hand was so weary, but so cramped, he played through the sword, but they had to pry his fingers off his sword. Then going on to read, then the people returned after him only to spoil. So they didn't even have anybody else that they had to uh, take care of this man and take care of all of them. But after him in verse 11 was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Karite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils, for the people fled from the Philistines. So they were there harvesting their crops. The Philistines came in to steal the crops. Then listen to what happens in verse 12. But he stood in the midst of the ground, and defied it, and defended it, and slew the Philistines, and once again, the Lord wrought a great victory. Anything that God accomplished, anything that that is done with your life, and you accomplish for the glory of God, it's done by the power of God. Amen. It's not ourselves, it's God. God brings the great victory. Verse 13. But three of the 30, 30 chief went down, 
They gave to David in the harvest time, but to the cave of Adullam, to the troop of the Philistines, pitched in the valley of Rephaim. But David was in the hold, in a hold, but the garrison of the Philistines was with them in Bethlehem. But David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So he was longing to be back home, to drink of that water there at his home. And verse 16, And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines that drew water out of the well of Bethlehem, that was by the gate, and took it, but brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he took not Therefore he would not drink it. These things did, did the three mighty men. So they went in and they, they stuck in. They broke through the garrison, the, the, the troops of the army. They swooped up the water, filled up the jug of water, but brought it back to their king. But sometimes there's things that God wants us to do that seem impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Moving along in verse 18, then Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zerubbabel, was chief among three. Then he lifted up his spear against three hundred and slew them, then at the name among three. Was he not most honorable of three? Therefore he was their captain. Howbeit he attained not unto the first three. So even though he was great, he still was, did not obtain but to the first three of David's mighty men. The verse 20, And then I, the son of Jehovah, the son of a valiant man of Kebazil, who had done many acts, he slew two lion men, lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow, but he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a staff that plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand then slew him with his own spear. These things did Benoni, the son of Jehodiah, and had the name among three mighty men. He was more honorable than the thirty, but he attained not to the first three. But David set him over his guard. Now, these were mighty men of God. The Bible says that they were David's mighty men. That you can be assured that these men did not become mighty men overnight. They took practice. They had to, I'm sure, uh, uh, practice all the time in their techniques of battle without a fight. Uh, well, I have a friend in the 82nd Airborne. He is constantly training. They are constantly training on their tactics and how they will uh, defend uh, their fellow soldiers and themselves in this country. And uh, it takes work to be a mighty man of God. It takes effort to be a mighty woman of God. It takes determination. Uh, you, you may purge. You may uh, have financial 
financial difficulties. You may have physical difficulties. You may have family difficulties. You may have work difficulties. But you can still be a mighty man of God, a mighty woman of God. We're going to have tribulations, but you, you can be a mighty person of God. And God's calling every one of us at these last moments of time to get out of our comfort zones and to be mighty women, the mighty men of God. Uh, he will enable us. He makes it possible that we will step forward and put forth our effort. Uh, you, you, in, in any military, you find that you have the lower ranking people, but then you have the people that have the longevity and that have put forth the test of time, that have put forth the effort, that have been promoted, and uh, they are, they come up in, in the ranks, and they're considered mighty men in, in battle. And that's the way each one of us should desire to be, this mighty men and mighty women of God. But it takes commitment, but it takes consistency. Too many times Christians are half-hearted. Too many times Christians will start well, but not finish well. Did you realize that God is going to judge us when how we finish? Amen. You can you can run a great race. You can run a race uh, part of the time, part of your life, and then at the end blow it. I see I've seen preachers here uh, just recently who have. Uh, One second. Preachers are up sadly, sadly uh, failed in the in their ministry. And many Christians who have sadly started well but finished poorly. But God's going to judge us how we finish, not just how we ran the race. Because the Lord does tell us that we can lose our rewards. That uh, if you want to have a place in heaven where you are considered a mighty man, a mighty woman of God, you're going to have to finish your race well. Uh, my dad is my hero. I mention him quite often because he finished well. He taught me my whole life. He was not a perfect man, but he got better and better and better with every day because he was committed to serving the Lord. But the only way you're going to be able to do that is through making a commitment to serve the Lord by getting in God's Word by praying, but by serving. It takes those three things to be a mighty man and a mighty woman of God. You can't just say, well, I'm going to do that later, I'm going to do that someday. You're running out of time. Now is the time to be about God's business like never before. We are in the last moments before the Lord's going to sound the trumpet and the resurrection rapture is going to take place. We are at that door. Uh, you just need, you can do the research on the internet yourself. You can look on YouTube, look up end times videos. You can look up all kinds of different things. You can look up my Facebook page, Samuel Hendon, and uh, you will see I post up stuff on a regular basis that uh, shows that we are in the last moments of time yes. before God calls us Christians home. It's coming very, very soon. We're going to be leaving this earth. 
we are heaven bound, those of us that know Jesus as our Savior. But are you going to be left behind? I ask you that, those of you that are out there online. Are you going to be left behind? When, this, when we leave this earth, are you going to be left behind? But that's something you need to seriously ask yourself because it's a serious matter. When, when, we, when we leave this earth, when, if you read in the book of Revelations, you will find that it's going to be absolutely hell on earth. Most of the population on this earth is going to die. The Bible says that if God did not uh, shorten the time, that no flesh would survive. You may think, well, oh, I'll fight off this or I'll fight off that, or I'll go fight on the woods. These woods, these mountains, they're going to be ashes because it's going to be so hot on this earth. The Bible says that it's going to scorch men's flesh. They're going to have to go underground and in caves to try to find shelter. The, the animals are going to start killing people because there's going to be a lack of food. And God's going to take away their fear of man. But people are going to be dying left and right. There'll be cannibalism. There'll be people raping and pillaging and uh, doing terrible, terrible things. And the kings of this earth will be hiding in their underground bunkers that they have built in our building even now. You can look those up on the internet. And uh, at one point in the tribulation, it's going to get so bad that they're going to cry out for the mountains to fall in on them because they're terrified of God. But all that's going to be happening after the Christians leave this earth Amen. and God starts dealing with Israel, trying to show them that they have missed their Messiah. You do not want to be left behind when that happens. Do you realize that God could come back today? He could sound the trumpet today. The day can be the day. We don't know the day or hour. The Bible says he's going to come like a thief of the night. He's going to come when no man expects it. And we find ourselves looking at all kinds of signs around us. Jesus said to watch over and over and over. If you read there in, in the Gospels, he says to watch, to watch, watch for certain things. But he tells us there in the uh, Old Testament and the prophets and the revelations what to watch for. But in Thessalonians, what to watch for. But it's all happening around us, all over this world. Just this morning, there was a uh, ginormous earthquake in Iran, uh, six points somewhere or another. And just every day, there's stuff happening all over the earth that, that God is trying to use to shape the world, to get Christians motivated, to get lost people saved so they aren't left behind. God wants his house to be full Amen. of his creatures, his people that he's made, that he loves you, he loves me, that it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All, that means you, that means me, that means your neighbor, that means everyone around you, all. Then what is repentance? Repentance is turning away from your sin and turning to God. Some of you are so, so stuck on your sin that you're not going to be able to, to uh, hold on to God because you want to hold on to, to your sin. It's like a, a proverbial monkey with his hand in the cookie jar. He won't let go of the cookie, so he can't get his hand out of the jar. You're going to have to let go of your sin yes. and turn to God if you want a home in heaven. 
You have to repent. You have to tell the Lord, I'm a sinner, I'm lost, God. I'm on my way to hell. I don't want to go there. Please save me. But it's that simple. Salvation is, is, is simple. But it's the uh, ABCs. It's the best way I can, simplest way I can explain it. But admit you're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned that come short of the glory of God. But the wages of sin is death. Your paycheck for sin is death. But if you have not received Jesus as your Savior, but the Holy Spirit comes into your heart, but seals your soul, all those sins have been charged to your soul. But when this body dies, the soul does not get to go to heaven. It goes down to hell, where it waits for judgment day. But that's the paycheck for sin. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's a gift. You don't have to pay for it. The salvation is by faith, through grace. It's a gift of God. It's by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. No one's going to be boasted in heaven about how they got there except for by Jesus. No one's going to say, I was baptized, or I received communion, or I had my sins resolved by a priest, or I uh, helped the orphans, or I did this, or I did that. Everyone that's there is going to say, I was a dirty, filthy sinner. Amen. I realized God opened my eyes that showed me my need, but I called out to him for salvation, but he saved me. That's the only way. You must admit you're a sinner, believe that Jesus died and rose again from the grave, but thirdly see, call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, that Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, but believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth, for with the heart, man believeth, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You believe with your heart, and then what's in your heart comes out through your co confession, through your communication. See, when I got saved, I automatically started telling people about it. It's like winning the lottery. If you were to win a lottery or inherit a great sum of money, you would tell everybody about it. You'd be so excited. I mean, if you, even if you win something small, you're excited. You ought to tell people about it. Well, imagine salvation, something as big as salvation. When you get saved, it's something you want to tell everybody about. And that Bible says, out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so you admit you're a sinner, believe Jesus died and rose again from, his, from the grave for your sins, and you call out to him for salvation. But if you do that, but it's from the heart, the Holy Spirit will come in, but he'll seal your soul, but he'll change your life, that it will make you into a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things will become new. All things. Wouldn't you like that in your life? If you don't have Jesus as your Savior, call out to him for salvation today. Because today could be your last day. None of us know the day nor hour that will pass away, but today could be the day. None of us know when the rapture is going to sound, but today could be the day. But if you don't have Jesus as your Savior, repent, turn to Him, call out to Him for salvation. He loves you, He died for you, and He wants you to be one of His children. 
He said to us, many of believe to be gave he, he them power to become the sons of God. Don't you want to be a child of God? Don't you want to live with him forever? Ask him, he will save you. But for each of you Christians that are watching, tell people about Jesus. But since we're running out of time, there's not time anymore to waste. This world is fleeting by faster and faster. Don't you see the pace things are picking up? You need to run a strong race. Finish well, like Paul said. He had fought a good fight. He had finished his course. He had ran a good race. He said there was a crown of righteousness laid up for him. But not just for him, but for all those that love him. The Lord's appearing. So if you don't, if you know the Lord, share him with somebody. If you don't know the Lord, call on him, he'll save you. This has been Sam Hinton with Bow Underwood Baptist Church. With Samuel Saving Ministries. God bless you until next week. We look forward to seeing you again. Much love.